I've titled it Empowered to Help. Help and reach to others. It is an indirect approach to the teachings of the New Testament about spirit baptism, being baptized in the Holy Spirit. But sometimes, and I've seen this through the years, being reared as a Pentecostal, that it gets caught up so much in doctrine and in dogma and you're exegeting passages of Scripture as a polemic or an apologetic to defend your position, and you get caught up in glossolalia and tongues, and you just you start missing the whole point of what the Bible is teaching us about to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Because it's not something just... Uh, ethereal or mystical. It's not something even doctrinal or just pure dogma or theology. It's not something to debate about. It's something to anticipate with an expectation that a greater provision has been given to us by God to enable us and empower us and help us to be able to help others. You see, I want to be able to help others. When I come out here, there's a fire in my soul that I'm looking at the opportunity individually, even though it's a big group of people, but individually to be able to help you in some way. That motivates me tremendously. It sets a fire underneath my heart because I want to be able to help someone. As a young man at 16, I was pretty self-absorbed, self-centered, self-focused. I was narcissistic, intoxicated with me. When I came to Christ, those who mentored me these precious men and women of God, they taught me the importance of snapping the back of self-centeredness and to have an attitude and a disposition that says, I want to reach out and help others, one at a time, but have that heartbeat within you. I thank God for those mentors in my life that taught me the importance, the significance, and the value of reaching out. I remember a song that was penned in the 70s by Keith Green, The lyrics are very simple. They simply say this, it's so hard to see when my eyes are on me. It's so hard to see when my eyes are on me. When you lift your eyes above yourself and you say, God, whatever talents, gifts, and abilities, whatever education I've received, all that you've deposited into my heart and my soul, I wanna be able to use that to bless and help and assist and aid and strengthen others. Now, the spirit baptism is God saying, listen, I want to empower you, not only naturally, but supernaturally, to be able to help and assist and aid and strengthen others. You see, I don't want my only resource that comes to the table to help you or an individual in your, in your sphere of influence, you know, in your workplace, your livelihood, your profession, you're surrounded with pulsating needs. You know that. There are people that are struggling with anxiety or fear or worry. They are depressed about circumstances that have unfolded in their life. Their marriage is collapsing. Relationships have gone south. Their finances are depleted. They're not in good health. There's so many needs around you. You can be overwhelmed and even intimidated by that reality. Or you can say, wow, God, you've given me gifts and talents and abilities. But in addition to those natural things that I want to mature, zero in on and and, and develop those skills in my life. I want to do that in the natural so I can better help and assist others. But I also need your supernatural intervention in my life to be able to help others. And the spirit baptism is talking about God's supernatural empowerment to enable us to help others. So don't get all caught up in the theology and the doctrine of the debate. Don't be intimidated or fearful that the Holy Spirit's gonna take over and suddenly you don't know what you're gonna be or do. Some of you have had very great experiences about the Holy Spirit in the context of the church. And some of you have had very distasteful, disturbing experiences about the Holy Spirit because you've seen some bizarre things that have been done in the name of the Holy Spirit that didn't have anything to do with him at all. Or you've seen this inordinate preoccupation with maybe a particular gift For some, it might be glossolalia, speaking in tongues, an unknown language that has been supernaturally deposited into you that you didn't have to do through study. I studied Spanish, German, Greek, and Hebrew. 
And boy, I know that it's a challenge. Languages did not come easy for me. Memorizing the vocabulary, declining the nouns, parsing the verbs, learning how clauses interrelate with one another, and it's very difficult, very challenging. I was, I marveled that God gives us a language supernaturally that you don't have to study, he just gives it to you, gets a hold of your tongue. But sometimes there's this preoccupation with just that, and you miss the whole purpose of the spirit baptism, the purpose. If you don't know the purpose of something, abuse is inevitable. If you don't know the purpose of something, you can't answer the why was this given or done, abuse or abnormal use is inevitable. If I hold a hammer in my hand and I don't know the purpose of it, instead of pounding a nail, I might pound you on the head. You have to know the purpose. So what was the purpose of spirit baptism? To empower you to help others. Naturally and supernaturally. Boy, if you can wrap yourself around that and not be narcissistic, not be self-centered, self-focused, and say, okay, I want everything that God would give to me to empower me and enable me and help me to be able to help others, then you'll be more open than ever. Apart from maybe negative or distasteful experiences that you've had in the past, or some of your speculation that you've had about what does this have to do with God? This whole thing about this whole Pentecostal emphasis and distinctive about spirit baptism and baptizing the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm concerned, is it, does it mean I get suddenly taken over? Listen, we don't teach Buddhism, that's self-annihilation. If you study the teachings, the, the actual tenets of Buddhism, it's self-annihilation, peel away self. Christianity teaches self-denial. So it's not a loss of identity, it's the proper positioning of your identity. It's not the loss of your will, it's the proper yielding, submission, and surrender of your will so that it's engulfed and embraced by God. It's not personality suicide. You don't lose your identity, personality, or your will. Now it is aligned with God. So the manifestation of your identity, your personality, even the fulfillment of your destiny is still you, but you are owned by, I know it sounds paradoxical, you're owned by, you're dominated, you're controlled, you're intoxicated with the Holy Spirit, but it brings freedom and liberty and the true manifestation of who God intended you to be. I know it's a paradox. It seems like a mystery, but it's an absolute reality when you say, okay, Holy Spirit, be fully in charge. I know what I'm like in the flesh. I've shared this before. I know what you're like in the flesh. If you wonder about that, just reflect on it. Maybe ask your colleague, your friend, someone at the workplace. No, no, ask your spouse. There was a, a husband in the early service said to me, yeah, my wife, since you've been using that terminology, you know, being in the flesh or being in the spirit, when I don't do well, she says, now see, you're in the flesh again. You're in the flesh. Diane will do that with me. She says it a little differently. She goes, I can smell your flesh. Yes. And sometimes it could lead to an argument and then I don't get a nice meal prepared, but I don't need it right now because I'm on Nutrisystem. <laughs> So they're all pre-made, pre-packaged. Spirit baptism. Listen to what is said of Jesus, or he says it himself in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. Here Jesus is speaking from the Old Testament, the Tanakh, the book of Isaiah, but he speaks of it about himself. Now remember, Christ, fully man, fully God. In Christology, the full humanity, the full deity of Christ. But when we reflect on his full humanity, we realize he had a dependence on this earth to the Holy Spirit. And this is what he said. Now you tell me if this is self-focused or the whole issue of the Holy Spirit being upon him was to reach to others. You answer this rhetorical question in your heart. The Spirit of the Lord, this is Jesus speaking, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, what? Anointed me to be seen, to be visible, to prove my spirituality. Anointed me for what? With just my gifts, talents, and abilities to do something. Anointed me with power to what? Break the yoke of what? Over who? Listen to what it said. To preach the gospel to who? The poor. Poor in spirit, poor financially. Poor, destitute, in need, desperate. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. You tell me, isn't that reaching out? the anointing, the Spirit of God empowering us to do something? What? To help others. To proclaim freedom 
to the captives or those around you. Maybe it's your own siblings, your parents, your children, grandchildren, work companion, a friend, a neighbor that has an addiction in their life. You see how ensnared they are? And logic or conversation, just simply a word of affirmation or encouragement isn't going to meet it. You need some power to see that bondage, that addiction in their life broken. Spirit baptism. The Holy Spirit's been sent to help you help them. Please hear that. Reach out away from yourself. Preach the gospel to the poor. Sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Proclaim freedom to captives. Recovery of sight to the blind. Think of those that are around you that are more than just physically blind, but spiritually blind. Spiritually blind. Their, their, their life and their perspective and their perception and their interpretation of things unfolding is so distorted, so convoluted, so confused that when you see and you say, this is blue, they're saying, no, it's green. And you wonder, where are they coming from? Why have they become so irrational? Why didn't it make sense? Because they're blind. They're blind. They can't see. And God anoints you by his spirit to remove the blindness. You think you're gonna be able to do that with just your intellect, being clever? You need the Holy Spirit to do something supernatural through you, to remove blindness and bring sight and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Remember the title that's given in the New Testament, chapter 14, 15, and 16 of the Gospel of John will give reference to the Holy Spirit as the parakletos. It's the Greek word, the one who has come to help. Different translations will handle it in a different way. You can translate it as the counselor, the comforter, the encourager, but the best denotation, not connotation, but the best denotation of the word, how it would be defined raw, right out of the Greek, would be the helper. What better way to say it? You know, when you're hurting in pain, you don't try to get real articulate or real sophisticated, you just say, you know what? I need help. I need some help. I think it's beautiful that God, the Holy Spirit, has the title, the helper. To do what? Oh, to help us, yes, but to help us to help others. Boy, if you could look at it through that lens, then no longer is is it a doctrine that could be disturbing. No longer does it seem irrelevant. Now it's so relevant. Tell me, meeting someone's need, is that relevant? Is that pragmatic? Is that empirical? Is it practical? Of course it is. To really help someone in their need. So come, Holy Spirit, not a mystery, but such a practical, relevant helper to help me, to help others. So spirit, baptism. We come at it in that direction. Understand first, it's come from Christ as a promise, and then the beauty of it, the purpose of it in your life. I've already identified it, but I'll just underscore it a little bit more. Jesus obviously felt it was extremely important. Are you a follower of Christ? If you're not, I invite you to come to know him. But if you're a follower of Christ, then his words are gold to you. And Jesus said, listen, and he says this in John 14, John 15, and 16, it's gonna be good for you that I go. What? I don't want you to go. It's good for you that I go so I can send to you the Holy Spirit. Now, if Jesus defined the importance, the priority of the Holy Spirit in your life in that way, you ought to listen. In the book of Acts, chapter one, it says, after the resurrection, Jesus was with the disciples and the apostles for 40 days. This is post-Calvary, after Jesus rose from the dead. It says amazing signs and wonders continue to happen. They're not recorded, but we could only conjecture on what they were, constantly identifying the fact that he was fully the resurrected Christ. And it says that he was teaching them, giving them commandments, and speaking to them about the kingdom. Very interesting, right? But then he tells them, listen, even though you got all this didactic, all this teaching, wait. You've got to Wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit to come. It triggered some of the disciples to say to him, Master, is Israel going to be restored? In other words, predict something for us. And what does Jesus do? 
He doesn't de-emphasize the importance of it. He accelerates and accentuates the tremendous importance of not just a future prediction about the state of Israel or what was going to come in the end. He says, listen, that's up to the Father to determine that. But for you, you need present power to advance the kingdom. So the orbs of the eyes of the disciples needed to be looking in the right direction. Instead of looking for predictive future prophecies, and again, I'm not minimizing eschatology in the study of end days, but he accentuated present power for right now. He says, when the Holy Spirit will come upon you in power, you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea, throughout Galilee and throughout all the world. So talk about the importance, the emphasis, the focus of Jesus. It transcended even doctrine, right? transcended his own teaching. It transcended what he was saying about the kingdom. It transcended even eschatology and predictive prophecy. He focused in on, you need power from the person of God, the Holy Spirit, to be what? A witness. Again, it's not about you, is it? A witness. Your verbal witness, your life witness for someone else. The promise Jesus gives to us But wait for the promise of the Father. The Father gave this as a promise for us that we can anticipate with expectation based on his character that he's going to do it and our desperate need of it. But wait for the promise of the Father. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. What's one of the most familiar passages of the New Testament? John 3, 16. God loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. We miss Luke 3.16 sometimes. In Luke 3.16, he tells us how we're going to do it. Here, John the Baptist is speaking, and he says this, I baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming who will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. This is what's being referred to. John came, baptized you with water, but we, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, come now, baptize you with the Holy Spirit, to be immersed, to be inundated, to be intoxicated. And again, I don't say that in a negative connotation. I say it in the most positive way. I'm going to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. I know what I am in the flesh. I want to know who I am in the Spirit. Oh, I hope that engenders a hunger, a thirst in you that goes beyond maybe your title, your position, your age, your education, Seeing above that and say, no, wait, wait, wait. I know what I am in the natural. You know, I'm an electrician, I'm a plumber, I'm an accountant, I'm a nurse, I'm a doctor, I'm an attorney, I'm a computer operator, a programmer. I... Who am I in the Spirit? When my life is yoked to God the Holy Spirit, who do I become? Have you ever heard this statement to you? You become a little bit of a different person around her. It's negative. You become a little bit of a different person around him. Now, move the negativity of that and think of it in a relationship. Boy, you really become a different person when you're with the Holy Spirit. Wow. I notice the difference in your life when you are yoked in communion, in fellowship, in connection with the Holy Spirit. You're really a different person. So based on that, Can you conjecture, speculate for a moment? What did God intend you to be in the Spirit? All of us. You're you're not to be like me, preacher behind a pulpit. I mean, I'm talking about you. You know what you're like in the flesh. You know how nasty you can get, angry you can get, lustful, lying. You know it. You know it better than anyone. You know that well. You can write a book on it. But do you know who you would be in the spirit? How God would fashion you, shape you and create you? Not that you'd be exalted, but how many would be helped by your life really being connected to the Holy Spirit? I know we blow it. I know we don't do it consistently. I don't. But I'm I'm set. I want to be set now more than ever that I would be not in the flesh, but in the spirit. 
I want to be tenacious and volitional and intentional and even militant in that decision every morning. Would you join me in that? Could you imagine how this generation will be impacted by lives being controlled and dominated by the Holy Spirit? There's no telling. Oh, maybe we can see a picture of it in the book of Acts and anticipate that. Or is that just closed? Is it over? God doesn't do that anymore? I don't believe that. He wouldn't tease you or me by giving us the book of Acts. I believe he wanted to stir up within us an expectation and anticipation and a faith to say, yeah, I want to believe, be like the believers of the first century, yielded to the Spirit of God, baptized in his Spirit to help others, to really help others. The purpose, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Wow. Now listen, if you want to just get a little theological here, I'll do that. When we talk about receiving Christ, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, I'm going to believe on him with my heart, confess him with my mouth, you're born again. That's conversion. Of course you receive the Holy Spirit at that moment. Otherwise, you're going to deny the doctrine of the New Testament, the Orthodox Christian doctrine of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, the Spirit, they're one. A unity and a trinity, a trinity and a unity. So when you receive Christ, of course, you're also receiving God, the Holy Spirit, and the Father. Any of my evangelical brothers who may not be Pentecostal or a little antagonistic, they think that I would be saying, no, you don't have the Holy Spirit. No, absolutely not. Biblically speaking, you have received Jesus. You've also received the Father and the Spirit. That's why in Romans chapter 8 and verse 11, it attests to the indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit, in the life of a converted, born-again believer. Contextually, if you were to exegete this, it's dealing with a born-again believer. And it says this, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who has raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So of course you have the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Then what is this subsequent experience that is presented in the book of Acts that you see it one chapter after another? And I know the book of Acts is not just a theological treatise. It's a historical account of what happened in the first century church. But nevertheless, you can form some good, strong doctrinal conclusions based on what you see in the book of Acts. And what you see in the book of Acts is believers that were believers, that had the Spirit, but then there was something subsequent to that that happened to some of them within minutes, days, weeks, or months, but it was Spirit baptism. Wow! An overflowing experience. Here, you can see it in John chapter 7, verse 38 and 39. Spirit baptism. Think of it now as not just the indwelling, but the overflow of the Holy Spirit through your life. Why? So that the waters that are in you now flow out of you to do what? To prove your spirituality? To impress others? No, to help others through his power. He who believes in me, that's a believer now, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This he spoke concerning the Spirit. The example that's given to us on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse 4, and they, that is the 120 that were gathered, were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. In Acts chapter 4, it speaks about, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they went out proclaiming the gospel boldly. Here the emphasis is on the initial overflow, what we would understand as the initial confirmation, the affirmation of the Spirit baptizing you with the touching of your tongue, setting it on fire. Now you think of that here, again, practically. What gets you in trouble more than anything in your body? Mm-hmm, it's right in the middle of your mouth. James said that. What gets you in trouble? Interpersonally, a tongue that's set on fire, according to James, by hell. 
A tongue that's been set on fire by hell. It says, boy, you can control all the other parts of you, but you just can't seem to get control of that tongue. He says, with, with your tongue, in one moment you're blessing and praising God, and the next moment you're cursing and attacking, maligning, critiquing, being condescending, prideful, arrogant, jealous, envious of another with your own tongue. Now James, the half-brother of Christ, he was a very prominent leader in the first century church. He's the one who presided over the Council of Jerusalem recorded in Acts 15. So James is saying, listen, okay, I deal with doctrine, but let's get real practical here. You got to wrestle down that tongue and make sure it's not set on fire by hell, but set on fire by heaven. And if you really want it to come under control, let the Holy Spirit dominate. Now, it's no mystery to look now through the lens of James 3 and the importance of how we handle our tongue, why the very first thing God gets a hold of is our tongue in spirit baptism. He gets a hold of your tongue and mine, and he sets it on fire with heaven. Now, it manifests with a language that you haven't studied or learned. Now, you, you, know, you, you, you might say, well, that isn't, you know, I, I want to be cerebral here and academic. Well, be cerebral, be academic. There's 6,900 languages on the earth. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 1 says that there's the tongue of men and the tongues of angels. So if not only do you have 6,900 languages, known languages on the earth, you got angelic languages. Wow, that's a lot of languages out there. They did a study at the University of Pennsylvania about what happens to the frontal region, the frontal lobe of the human brain when someone prays in tongues because that's the part of the brain that's used for speech. So they anticipate for it to be lit up. But it isn't. When someone's praying in tongues, nothing's happening in the frontal region. It's kind of unusual. It perplexed those who were doing this investigation in their study. But it's consistent with what the scripture says when it says those who pray in the spirit, their mind remains unfruitful. It bypasses it because it's an utterance given by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's supernatural. It's mystical. It is rather amazing. But he does it. And he touches your mind and your heart, yes. Think of it, when you take medicine, most of us here, we're not medical doctors or nurses, so we don't know what it's going to actually do. All you do is you take it, got that antibiotic, and you know it's going to do something. Is your mind fruitful? Does your mind understand everything, the complexity of chemically what's actually happening within you physiologically? No. I have no idea. I had to take several antibiotics this week. Boom, boom, got in. Do your thing, man. I have no idea. My mind is not fruitful, but I know it's doing something in me to get me better. Well, you know, when I pray in the Spirit, when I come up here, I know I'm going to be using English for several hours throughout the morning. So I'll come in here and pray in the Spirit for about two hours before the service is. Why? Well, I think of Ephesians chapter 6, where it talks about the armor of God, and at the end of the list it says, and praying in the Spirit. Wow. It's part of my armor, praying in the Spirit. And then in Romans chapter 8, it talks about when you pray in the Spirit, you don't understand what you're doing, but you're so heavy in your heart, you've got to articulate a prayer to God, and you can't even use words. And it says you'll have groanings and utterances that are generated. The genesis of them comes by the Holy Spirit as you pray in the Spirit. Or Jude chapter 1, verse 20, it says, praying in the Spirit, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. So I know the importance of praying in the Spirit because it empowers me again what? To be able then to articulate in English help to others. The beauty of a language that God gives to you supernaturally, a miracle in your own mouth and expressing it. I know there's times when you might think it's gibberish. You know, I can get very intellectual in my assessment of things. I'm very empirical. God knew, wow, I always wondered, how will I ever be a man of faith? Because I can get very cynical and very skeptical. I want to see it, taste it, touch it. I want you to analyze it. I want you to prove to me that you are operating intellectually, academically. You're using your cerebral region when you're assessing this. It isn't just feeling oriented. It's not, you're not decapitated and operating from the neck down. So God knew when he got me, he was getting a very cynical, skeptical individual. I wonder how I ever came to the place of believing and believing and believing. But the Holy Spirit brought me there. And when this whole thing about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, it seemed so experiential. It was like, come on, there's a lot of emotion here, a lot of feelings. I want some intellect and brain brought to the table here. Well, I was being arrogant and prideful. Some of the greatest minds have been influenced by the power of the Holy Spirit. Believe in the baptism in the Spirit. 
But the whole thing with the language, that again was intimidating to me and I thought it was gibberish. So when I went forward and some men of God in our church, they prayed over me, I, I, I started having, I, I realized, wow, you know, Jesus is more than a feeling, but sometimes you do feel him. And you, Holy Spirit's more than a feeling, but sometimes you do feel him. And I felt his presence. And in, in that moment, th- there was no uh, confirmation to me or affirmation. I don't like using the terms proof and evidence. You know, prove. The proof and evidence of the spirit baptism is you will speak in tongues. I really think that derails the whole focus of the New Testament. Where do we ever get those two? Proof and evidence. That's for everyone else. In the New Testament, it's, hey, this is affirmation confirmation, provision, so that I can help others. Oh, that's so much more palatable to me. Okay, I desire that, Lord. And so when they prayed over me, I just, I sensed, wow, something's filling me up more. And I went home and I prayed and nothing really happened. And I, I prayed again the next night when I went on my knees. All of a sudden, yeah, some just started to come to me. These were the first words. It was, and I got a little nervous. I knew I was alone, so I thought, I'm not going to be embarrassed. This is like gibberish. It's ridiculous, but wait. In the New Testament, there's examples of it. When the believers came out in the book of Acts, they were speaking languages that they never learned. So maybe I'm speaking a language that I've never studied or learned. I don't know. So I did something that, uh, where's my Bible? Where's my Bible? Who stole my Bible? We're not leaving here till my Bible's returned. Well, what I did was I said, Lord, if this is really you, now I'm 17 years old, this is not the right way to get guidance. I opened my Bible and I went, and you know what? The Lord met me. Now remember, I was 17 years old, immature, didn't know it, and now you can't use it because I'm telling you that's not the way to do it. And I landed right on Matthew chapter 10. And it was verse 18, 19, 20, it says, it's not you that speaketh, but the spirit of my father, the Holy Spirit that's speaking through you. And I was like, wow. Now you understand what happened as a result of that. Not only was I touched, but I started teaching others. Do you, do you want to know what's going on in your life? You need guidance? Okay, come here. Open your Bible. Ready? Give me your hand. Here we go. Boom. <laughs> yeah, it was like, oh God. God set this immature one free. I realized that is not the way to gain his guidance and direction, but he was gracious and he revealed to me, you know, I, I, I remember a buddy of mine when I was at Oral Roberts University, we were coming up the stairs, it was the second floor of our dormitory, and he was very antagonistic, and I understood that about, he thinks it's all gibberish, all this stuff, when people are praying in tongues, it's, it's not a language and all that. We were coming up the stairs and we heard way in the background, someone that we felt was praying in the spirit. And he said, listen to that. And I said, yeah, I, it, it, yeah it, did, it didn't sound right. And he said, this is unbelievable. So we get up on the floor. We start walking down the hallway. Remember when they used to have public phones? Not cell phones. Public phones that you had to put quarters in. That's what we had in the dorm. You know what it was? It was a Vietnamese brother. And it wasn't that Vietnamese wasn't a beautiful language and we were making fun of it. But he was talking really, really fast because he was really, really excited because he just got engaged to his girlfriend there in Vietnam. So as we come around the corner, thinking he's praying in the spirit, he's speaking his mother tongue just really fast. So I look, I said, you know, so much for us, brilliant ones, knowing languages. Because we were critiquing one that was there. So if you've done that, you're not as brilliant as you think. God desires to bless us. The scripture says, I will pray with my spirit, and I'll also pray with my understanding. I'll sing with my spirit. I'll also sing with my understanding, incorporating both. Can I give you a real quick, simple illustration, and then we're going to land with that? Next week, I'm going to talk about some of the things with the gifts of the spirit. Because, uh, you know what, let me do that first. The gifts of the spirit, there's beautiful gifts that have been given in the overflow. And again, it's about helping others. I'll give you one example, okay, before I give the illustration. A word of knowledge. There's nine gifts that are listed in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 12, and then they're explained in 1 Corinthians 14. One of them is the word of knowledge. That means you, you, you gain a piece of information that you haven't done through study or experience. It supernaturally is given to you to help someone, all right? A word of wisdom is, is an insight. 
an understanding, a revelation that creates an epiphany moment for someone. They're com- you know, there's, there's complicated data that's coming their way or circumstances that are unfolding. They can't figure out, they can't connect the dots. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit gives you a word of wisdom and it comes like an epiphany moment. It's like, wow, this is what God's saying and doing. And all the dots connect. There's healing, miracles, faith. But a word of knowledge, for example, was almost 10 years ago, about 10 years ago, that this young little boy was about five years old. He was singing in our children's choir. I came to one of the rehearsal nights and I saw him. Cute little guy, curly hair, wonderful heart, beautiful voice, and he was preparing. I went to Armine. I said, Armine, who is that young man? She told me. She goes, but Pastor, you need to get the whole story. I said, what? The mother's over there. I want you to talk to her. So I went to her and I said, hi, uh, your son. She goes, yeah, Pastor, I don't think I've ever shared this with you. I came on a Sunday morning and uh, I had gotten pregnant. It wasn't planned. And I decided I was going to abort the child. And I, I knew it wasn't right. And please hear me. I know we all know it's sin and it's murder. I also know God can bring forgiveness. There's a beautiful ministry we have in the church for those of you that have done that. You know you sinned, it was murder, you've repented, and God wants to heal your heart. But she was saying to me, in the middle of your sermon, you stopped and you said, listen, there's someone here, you're contemplating having an abortion. Matter of fact, I think you're thinking of doing it today after the service. Please don't do that. Please, God has given you a life. Don't take it. She looked at me, she says, that's the little boy. I said, because I remember that morning, I got emails that were critique me. I said, why did you do that in a service? You brought up the issue of abortion. What was going on? That was nonsense. It was ridiculous. I remember, and I never heard anything about it. And I'll be honest with you, I kind of like, yeah, why did I do that, Lord? Was that even you? And it was interesting. Years later, it saved that little boy's life and helped that mom. <laughs> Holy Spirit baptism, the gifts of the Spirit to help others. This symbolizes you and me. I'm going to go to that now. And maybe hard to see in the back, so we'll just put it up there. This symbolizes you and I. We know where it's going, but I really felt in my heart the Lord wanted me just to do it so you see it. You see it. It's up there. This is you and I. When we're converted, the Holy Spirit, here's the blue. Now, I know this is not an endorsement of the Democratic Party. Okay? And I didn't use red intentionally because I didn't want you to think I was going Republican. All right? I know the elections. I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. I'm going to vote by conviction and policy. Okay, but the blue is heavenly, okay, it's the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, he's poured into your life, and yeah, it alters the color of your life. Wow, you've been hanging out with him. You're a different person when you're with him. There's a whole new color to your life, and what pours out of you is impactful to others. Yes, yes. So this is conversion. This is Romans chapter 8. This is uh, uh, the the passage in, in, uh, in John 3. But spirit baptism is when the Holy Spirit just begins to pour into you and it's the overflow, the overflow. And it it catches your tongue first and then it just keeps pouring out of your life so that the overflow of your life impacts others, living water that flows out of you to help others. Amen? Can we stand together? We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your presence in our lives, God the Holy Spirit, in conversion that you indwell us. But Lord, we're a people that say we want spirit baptism. We want to overflow with rivers of living water. And in the overflow of our life, the waters come forth and they bring satisfaction and help and aid and assistance unto others. Would you do that in and through us, Lord? In Jesus' name. Now, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say right where you're at. I know it's 104, but you know what? Let's just step a little bit above time, and let's be in eternity. How long, Pastor? Not too long. But would you let this be a a providential, sovereign moment? Again, kind of snap the back of self-focus. 
and say, God, I want everything you want me to have. Please say in your own heart, God, I want everything you want me to have. All the provision that you have given so I can help others. That I can really, when you help others, it's better than winning the lotto. It's better than having a ton of money. When you help others, it's incredible. They've even done studies on that. They've done studies on the impact of you observing a kind act, it actually re releases the endorphins in your brain that causes you to feel good. When you do it or you receive it, it does it. But when you actually do it yourself, it's unbelievable. Your, your head just lights up whoosh, with so much of a sense of high because you're helping someone else. So would you just say, God, I want to be able to help others. And if being spirit baptized is one of those ways that you've ordained, I want to be spirit baptized. I want you, God, the Holy Spirit, to just fill me to overflowing in my life. Jesus, you're the baptizer in the Holy Spirit and fire. Lay a confirmation come with glossolalia, the beauty of the prayer language, and then it, let it overflow with all the gifts of the Spirit and all that you desire to do in and through us, even with the accelerated cultivation of the fruit of the Spirit in our life as a result of the Spirit baptism. We thank you and we praise you. So right where you're at, if you just say that, Lord, I'm open to it happening to me right now, pour it out upon me. If you'd like to come forward, there's gonna be leaders right up in the front here. If you don't know Christ, you can come and receive Jesus to be your Savior and your Lord. If you say, no, I want someone to pray over me for spirit baptism, please come forward. Don't hesitate. Don't be fearful. Don't be antagonistic against it doctrinally. Just be open to say, God, I need all the provision that you've provided so I can help others. Maybe in your own heart you say, I have, but I'd like the gifts to begin to flow through me and I'd like someone to pray for me. Please avail yourself to prayer that could accelerate something that God wants to do in your life. So the altars are open. Let's lift this as our song. Prayer can happen right now, and then I'll declare the benediction. Father, this is our desire and our prayer. It is your promise unto us as your sons and daughters. I pray this blessing upon your life. You need provision from God in your marriage, in your parenting, in the workplace, in the school, in your sphere of influence, and so may the anointing and the presence of the Holy Spirit, spirit baptism, to be immersed and overflowing with him in your life. That God's provision to enable you and empower you to help others naturally and supernaturally would be on your life. That you would know who you are, not just in the flesh, but in the Spirit. I pray this blessing on your life now. From this day forward, you will leave changed in Jesus' name. Would you say, I receive this blessing. I receive this blessing over my life. God bless you. Give a hug to one another, would you? Tell your brother, your sister, you love them. Now walk in the Spirit with the fullness of His Spirit.